Please join me in welcoming Rolf to Google. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. So it's about once upon a try, which sounds a little bit like once upon a time, which is usually the beginning of fairy tales. And in some way, I'm telling you a story of a fairy tale, namely um, how humankind has sort of always been curious about its origins and what's <clears throat> happening around it, what are these little um, twinkling lights there in the sky, you know, and they try to find out. And um, in this tradition, I mean, CERN is still working very hard and trying to find out what actually is the origin of our universe, how it evolved, and what are the particles, how are they related to space and time. And all this we are trying to bring together with Google to the general public. And so today I will talk about three things. Uh, first of all, for those who might not exactly know what CERN is, I will give a short overview about what we are, <clears throat> how we are financed, how, what we are doing, and um, what are our instruments. The second part will then be our collaboration with Google Arts and Culture, which is, I think, a really very useful collaboration of two giants in their respective fields, you know, in IT and in particle physics. And then I will sort of in the end give you a little bit the, the highlight of our collaboration, an overview about the Big Bang um, Augmented Reality app, which you can download um, for free from Google Store or from the Apple Store. And um, um, I talk also a little bit about the, the challenges which you have in, in such a collaboration and, um, and of course the outcome. So let me start with CERN and the LHC. First of all, you see the beautiful landscape around Geneva, which of course is a big motivation to work there. Because <laughs> you see the Mont Blanc, the lake and all these places. And then you see this um, little yellow line, which we haven't yet painted on the surface, but it shows you where the LHC tunnel is actually. And now if I zoom in, you will see that it's um, about 100 meters underground. It's 20 seven kilometers long, so about 16 miles. <clears throat> and it's in this tunnel and there's this high-tech instrument which we call the Large Hadron Collider, which is um, an accelerator which accelerates particles to 99.9999991% of the speed of light and then brings them into collision in four interaction points. I'll talk about that in a minute, a little bit more. Now, what you have to know about CERN in a few lines is it's already quite an old institution. It's 65 years old. Um, it is um, funded and paid by um, 23 member states. In the original 1954, it was just 12. Now we have um, 23 plus eight associate member states from practically all over the world. Our budget is about 1.2 billion dollars, 1.1 billion euros, and we have a staff of 2,500 people, mainly actually engineers and technicians, um, some physicists, but not so many, because um, usually our physicists come from outside. We have a very big international collaboration of 13,000 um, scientific users, which come from 110 different countries. So this is probably something like the UN of science, you know, the um, <clears throat> CERN. Um, well, in a nutshell, the only thing you really have to understand about the physics of CERN is that um, you, in particle collisions, you create um, a state of matter which is so hot and so um, energetic, so it has such a high energy density that it resembles a little bit um, the state of the entire universe after about um, a trillionth of a second. So after the Big Bang, you know, so that is basically the key of what we are doing. So we are transforming the energy which is in the movement, in the kinetic energy of the particles into the mass of new particles which we create at that very moment. So in each collision, which you see now, we create something like 500 or 1000 new particles which were not there before and which now, some of which are 
may, uh, are really new for us. For example, the Higgs boson, about which I will talk in a minute. Or it might be that it contains also particles which we don't even know yet. And they, they might or <clears throat> probably have um, some very important information about the very early universe. Now, in a nutshell, you see the CERN is made out of accelerators, very small ones, which um, start basically the acceleration chain and then bigger ones and even bigger ones until we go to the LHC. And you see the last part of it where we inject particles from the superproton synchrotron into the LHC. And after about 20 minutes, they have an energy which is high enough and they start to collide. For something like 12 hours, the beams collide. And then we sort of re-inject new beams. And in each of these collisions, of which we have about a billion per second, um, you produce these new particles. So you can imagine what kind of data rate we have. It's about a petabyte per second. And this is then <clears throat> um, digested by huge farms of computers and um, the LHC computing grid. Speaking about the results, what we have found out is the universe actually is built in a pretty simple way. It's um, If you know what a quark is and what an electron is, then you are already in good shape because taking these little Lego blocks and you can build from two up quarks and one down quark, you can build a proton and two down quarks and an up quark is a neutron. You can build the nuclei with the electrons, you can have the atoms and with atoms you can build molecules and you are cat at home and the seeds here and whatever, the whole world is made out of these particles. Now, for us, the most important one is, of course, the proton. And you see in this animation, the three quarks and the gluons, which are exchanged between. But that's not the important part which I want to talk about. The important part is that we have discovered in the same way as CERN is now doing um, a collision with very, very high energy, we have discovered that um, <clears throat> They are more than the particles actually we need in this universe. They exist. I mean, they are sort of replications of this family of up and down quark and electron. It's neutrino. Three more. I mean, there are three families in total. And um, all these particles have been discovered over the last um, 60 years. Some of them very close to here at Stanford. Some of them at Fermilab and recently more of them at CERN. And the la latest one was the discovery of the famous Higgs boson, which is um, also part of our um, little um, exhibit, which I show in a minute. Now, the question is, after we have discovered all these particles and we've grouped them in a nice sort of kind of a periodic table of particles, is that it, <clears throat> have we finished? Um, can we now put the final formula on a t-shirt and say, that's it, you know, that is the world formula. Actually, um, you need a big t-shirt. <laughs> you need a pretty big t-shirt. This is the sort of the formula which describes the interaction of all these particles that we know of. It's on the one hand a fantastic achievement because um, there hasn't been one single experiment which could not be described actually by this formula or whatever the Lagrangian you call it of the standard model. You can simplify it a little bit, we cheat and put it on a t-shirt but in principle this simplified formula is just a cheat because it contains basically all the elements of the formula on the left. So with other words the standard model cannot be the final answer. We know that there is more to it. We know that there is, for example, dark matter, dark energy, and all these things. And um, well, the job is not done yet. But when talking about the evolution of the universe and um, how it came about, we have understood, we believe at least, the main um, steps, the main evolution. And we see that the laws of nature, which were sort of coming into existence in the very, very first moments, in the first trillions of a second, you know, and <clears throat> of the universe, they basically made that all these particles together, they self-assemble. It's like a big self-assembling Lego game. So the up and the down quarks make protons and neutrons. Then you have a nucleosynthesis, the helium. And then after 380,000 years, the universe is cold enough in order to atoms can form. And then 
a few mil billion years later, even sort of stars um, f produce heavy elements, you know, which later on then, um, yeah, go into star solar systems and planets and finally um, life, intelligence and consciousness. So these are the big steps, and that is basically well understood by the two pillars of general relativity, which describes the big sort of expansion of space and the dynamics of space-time, and the standard model, which are the actors, the particles, which then produce sort of tangible outcomes. Okay, now that is basically the end of my particle physics <laughs> lecture and I go back to our collaboration between CERN collaboration and between CERN and Google Arts and Culture. So once upon a try is this journey of <clears throat> invention and discovery where not only CERN but also NASA and uh, no, more than 100 museums around the world um, have created huge websites and um, websites and these websites contain some of the inventions and discoveries that we have done at CERN. Now why did CERN agree on that and was very um, positive about it? Because the world's cultural heritage online, we consider ourselves as being part of this cultural heritage. You know, science is not a different part of culture. You know, science is culture. So that's the first thing. Secondly, our big goal is that everything that we are we discover at CERN has to be made public to everybody and in a way that they can understand it. So to partner with Google and bring these discoveries online and for free to everybody is of course exactly um, up our street. Then the focus on science and technology is of course something also what we um, would very much like because as you know STEM subjects and inspiration of young people is a very important issue nowadays. And finally um, to talking about the Big Bang and bringing it in augmented reality into your pocket, you know, and you can look at it when you, whenever you have a bit of time, I think it's a very nice idea. So being myself very much engaged in education at CERN, this collaboration was perfect and therefore Google and CERN, we are strong partners I think and there are many future opportunities to collaborate again in this um, way. Now I tell you a little bit about a story about our collaboration. So that's how it started about um, a little bit more than two years ago, Michael Fernhaber from um, Hamburg, actually, head of global um, strate strategic engagement, you know, um, was um, contacting me, you know, and he came to CERN, we discussed a little bit, you know, and he was saying, we would love to explore how CERN and Google could create an innovative and high-end experience together. And so that's what we did. And um, the first mail he sent to me showed me that it's a good idea actually to talk about CERN <laughs> and um, what actually CERN is. Because clearly, you know, there are many rumors and there are many sort of conspiracy theories and what are these people doing, you know, and um, are they opening the portal to another dimension and there are ET coming out and so on and so on. So, Michael. <coughs> is in a very positive way, I would say that. He probably Googled what CERN is and um, came up with a few questions. For example, who invented the internet? Well, my notes were it wasn't us because um, he probably meant the World Wide Web, but he said the internet, I think the internet was something else. What is antimatter? I said, yeah, uh, Angel and the Demons. We worked on Angel and the Demons together with Ron Howard, so we watched this film. Um, dark matter, yeah, I wish I knew what it was, you know. It's, what is an, a Mandela effect? I googled that, I has something to do with something you've seen before or don't, but it, which is not true. Um, what is the CERN portal? I told you, conspiracy theories, you know, and so we need to demystify it. What is the Higgs boson? Very interesting question. What is the CERN super collider? Well, it's a large hadron collider. <laughs> and where is it? Not far from my office. <laughs> Uh, what is the Higgs boson? I think I've seen this question just before. Um, what is the God particle? It's the Higgs boson. <laughs> and so on and so on. So anyway, so um, in the end um, I said, yeah, let's now fix um, with the team from Google Arts and Culture in Paris and in London all the questions which we had. And so um, they are a fantastic team. 
very nice people, very professional. So I worked with um, Google Institute in Paris, in London. And finally, sort of, there was the company which did all the animations, Nexus Company in London, which um, Claire, Laura, Suyin, and I am. And I mean, it was really a very nice collaboration we have. And these are the list of topics which we did. 10 things you didn't know about CERN. That was something straightforward because there are many things people don't know about CERN. Um, a stroll through CERN's underground. We used the existing street view um, from um, which Zurich, um, Google Zurich had done already 2012, but which was not so much used. The strange world of antimatter, my own past history, you know, I could bring it in. That's probably why this part is the most boring part of the whole um, sort of website, you know, because when you know too much about the subject, it's not good. <laughs> um, of course, the birth of the, uh, the birth of the World Wide Web. Um, you are all interested, probably. I mean, the World Wide Web is probably one of the reasons why we are here now. <laughs> and um, of course, that was a tricky subject because, you see, very often um, Tim Berners-Lee is, is, of course, still a very good friend of ours, you know, and so on. But um, he has, of course, the insider view of exactly how the development of the World Wide Web um, went ahead. And that is not exactly how it's always described in the um, sort of in the public, you know, and about the relations with the supervisor and the super, uh, the CERN management at that time was maybe a little bit more strained than it sort of appears in this history. So it was a tricky and sensitive way to how to phrase all these different things. But I think we succeeded. The hunt for the Higgs boson, I will show you in a second, um, the how we sort of framed that story so that you can um, sort of relive a little bit um, this whole saga which started in 1964 and ended in 2012. And then we have a large photo collection of hundreds of thousands of um, photos. And when sort of Google Paris said, oh, we need this photo collection, I said, this will be daunting because um, our um, captions and so on are not very um, perfect. And so, <laughs> so anyway, we, I think we managed to get something. And of course, the hero project is the Big Bang augmented reality. So now we went on to work and the Google team was full of ideas and, um, and came up with this lots and lots and lots of suggestions. But there was a bottleneck. And the bottleneck is this person, which uh, was sitting there sort of trying to get um, all these ideas um, into some content, which sort of could be sort of not only shown to the general public, but was also defendable um, towards my colleagues, you know, because if something sort of is wrong, yes, I mean, <laughs> there's always scientists which say, well, made a mistake here, you know, how can you do that, you know. Anyway, so the outcome is you can explore CERN from home. <clears throat> um, we have five nice stories, I think, and a big photo collection on the Google Arts and Culture website. Um, the one I don't speak about more is the birth of the World Wide Web because it's pretty straightforward. You can explore the Antimatter website, you know, which contains basically an overview about all the experiments which are done at CERN and on Antimatter in the Antimatter facility. Then you have a stroll through the CERN's underground spaces and the um, website about 10 things you probably didn't know about CERN. I will show you just to give you an idea um, how these um, websites um, have been constructed, how the exhibits sort of um, tell the story. I will give you an overview about <clears throat> the discovery of the Higgs boson. It's a creeping story because it starts in 1964 when some um, scientist who never, nobody at that time had heard before, Peter Higgs in, in Scotland, came up with an idea about how elementary particles, which are basically points, you know, how they can obtain a property which we call mass. You know, when you push them and they resist. And how can that be, you know, when, when they are sort of a point, you know? How can a point resist your force? And the idea was that maybe our universe, since the very beginning of the universe, is filled with a field which encompasses everything. And this field has <clears throat> a finite value and interacts with these particles. So basically like in a super fluid, in a frictionless liquid, where you can float and nothing happens, 
But once you ch want to change your momentum in one or the other way, um, this sort of medium around it, it says no, or resists at least this change of the momentum. And that's what we call mass. Well, that was pure theory in 1964. But little by little, it became kind of the one of the most important parts of missing parts of the so-called standard model. And so over 50 years, people tried to find um, the excitation of that field, which is the Higgs boson, and tried to, to prove that this theory was correct or not. And so in the 4th of July, 2012, CERN in the auditorium made a big announcement. And that's where the story starts. And then we flash back basically to 1964 and showed how, well, first of all, um, people were a bit frustrated about um, not finding this Higgs boson. But as they went along, um, there was a competition between the US and Europe in building the biggest super collider in the world. And then the US decided not to build the super collider. And I show you the, the, some of the excerpts from the, um, press, uh, from the Senate and Congress discussions at that time. And then finally, the LHC was approved. And it took about 20 years to build it and to get it working. And so that's the whole story. And of course, it ends then with a big discovery. Yeah. So that's the today is a special day that's our director general speaking. because we hear two presentations from the two experiments atlas and cms on their update on a search for a certain particle atlas is very pleased to present here today uh, update the results on standard model x searches i'm kind of nervous for some reason i'm not sure zooming in this region this is what you see and now there is a flashback to 1964 you see the papers by peter hicks and um, some others. And then, of course, in the 80s, the run for the super collider, which was announced by Ronald Reagan. The <clears throat> superconducting super collider is the doorway to that new world of quantum change, of quantum progress for science and for our economy. And then at that time, the cost had risen, and there was a heated discussion in the Congress and the Senate. <clears throat> Should we abandon or even delay the superconducting super collider? The Europeans will build the world's largest smasher and they'll reap the harvest of spin-offs that will be an outgrowth of this project. You may get nothing. You may get nothing out of this. It would be a shame for our great nation to shrink from this intellectual adventure. Then Leon Lederman was quite frustrated and wrote the book about the goddamn particle, which was then called the God particle because the editor didn't want it. This is what you see. <laughs> One big and then spike. 20 years later. We have a discovery. We should stay there. We have a discovery. We have observed a new particle consistent with this eight weeks ago. Maybe one. Well. The whole story is about 15 minutes long, so I have no time to show everything to you. But I think it's worthwhile digging into all these different um, stages of the discovery. So um, now that brings me to the third chapter of my talk, which is the um, <clears throat> story about the Big Bang. Now, you know that um, our universe is about 13.8 billion years old, and it has gone through several stages. Now, we wanted to create um, a, a, a little app, which is not sort of um, too <clears throat> complicated, which tells the story of the universe and sort of um, goes exactly um, together with the whole concept of um, Google Arts and Culture. Namely, um, taking one big work of art and showing every single pixel of it. No, well, the universe is a big word of a uh, big work of art. You know, it's a kind of a, a ten to the eighty pixel sort of um, <laughs> work, which we um, sort of try to understand, and we try to understand how did it sort of evolve into the stage it is today. So it is something which might also inspire young people to sort of help us to find out more of these mysteries 
of which there are many remaining. And finally, for myself, I think it is also important to, to give people the possibility to look at this and to, to, to put themselves into a cosmic perspective, you know, because clearly it's a very important message, I think, to many of us nowadays, especially nowadays, to <laughs> take into account that we exist only for about a hundred thousands of the age of the universe. We are all the same species and have the same origin. And we live just on this tiny little planet into a giant in a giant universe. And I think these are all messages which um, sort of are somehow contained in this little app, you know. Now, if you look at this um, picture, which is very often shown, you know, you see that astrophysicists have dominated a little bit the evolution of the universe. You know, there's always sort of like a big bang and then suddenly there's a star and the galaxies and all the rest is basically about astrophysics but particle physicists like me they say hey we are there at the very beginning you know what happened in the very first seconds you know because that is basically when all the decisive the parts of the universe were made so um, the challenge was to take all these books on the early universe gravitation standard model and put them into seven minutes <laughs> 13.8 billion years compressed in seven minutes. Now, without being too scientific, of course, so it, we put it into the entertainment section, but it should also be a little bit emotional. I had to leave out some complex parts, which are maybe too complex, and sometimes we even don't know the answer. So maybe that's the part where our young um, generation can help. How do you visually represent everything is a big question. And finally, also, we wanted a very nice voice and a famous um, speaker. So I contacted Tilda Swinton and she was happy to um, do the voiceover, at least in the English. So in the script, what we have, we have the Big Bang itself, at least sort of from a certain tiny moment after the beginning, the particle creations, the protons and neutrons form, the lightest nuclei form, atoms come about and so on and so forth. The first stars and the nucleosynthesis after about um, 200 million years, stars explode and produce nebulae and then the solar system and the earth form something like 9 billion years after the Big Bang. What was very important for me and for my colleagues and for everybody I think who is in this field is that the timing is correct, you know, because um, the timing is very tricky because the times at the very beginning are extremely short and then sort of become extremely long. So we have to make sure that we are not losing people. So there's a little timer which runs along the appearance and you can see that um, later on. Now, um, of course, the temperature of the universe is also very important. And now, when after I've said what is in the app, you ask yourself what is not in the app. And there's a lot of things which are not in the app. For example, things which we really um, believe we understand, but not so well, you know. For example, the very first stage of the universe, which is called inflation, when space and time didn't contain much except some kind of false energy, we call it, some inflaton field, which nobody has ever seen, but maybe it existed. Why did the antimatter disappear? How did the Higgs boson field come along? What is the um, lithium-7 problem, horizon threat? I mean, there are kind of lots of different details which were too complicated to put in. And of course, the dark matter and the dark energy question, you know, what keeps the galaxies together and why is the universe accelerating faster suddenly after six, seven billion years of its existence? We don't know that and that's some of the part which we try to understand. Also, the size of the universe, you know. We know the observable universe has a diameter of something like 90 billion light years nowadays. But we don't know if the real universe is maybe 10 to the 10 times bigger. It could be. You know, so we don't know that. Okay, then step two was to find all the visuals. You know, we don't know how a particle looks like, so we have to represent it with some kind of little smarty um, sphere, you know, a green and blue, representing color charges, electric charges, and so on. And then, of course, um, when you go into the astrophysics, fortunately, we have big pictures from Hubble and from ESO and from VLT, which give us an idea, for example, about how protoplanetary disks actually look like. 
Then uh, there's always nitty gritty details where you fight with the animators about how they have to present certain paths and how do we get more action at the beginning? Is the trans background opaque and transparent? The background temperature? The nuclei have to be spherical and not linear. These are all little things, but they are very important in order to give a good authenticity, you know. And we fought about the timing for a long time. So there were many, many, many versions <laughs> from the very beginning, you know. Nexus, this is the company, they were in a good mood. And as we went along, you know, you know, we were at version number 80 it's as the launch date approached, you know. And so we had to work. I mean, as you see, we worked in batches, you know. And um, but it was really in the end, I think everybody was very happy with the result. And so I just show you the announcement of that, you know, because I don't have time to show you all the seven minutes. And so that is basically our little um, publicity announcement. The big and you bang. hear the voice of the moment the a tiny speck packed with energy suddenly expanded, giving birth to space and time. The stars collapse and explode as giant supernovas. Planets form, and our solar system is born 13.8 million years after the Big Bang. You too could be a part of the next big discoveries about our universe. So you are <clears throat> cordially invited to download the Big Bang AR app. Um, it has been downloaded already quite a lot, so we were quite successful. Before I left on holidays, we were close to 300,000 downloads. About, um, yeah, so that we hope that we are getting to 1 million um, soon. We got lots of positive feedback. Um, like, I've only been through the first chapter, but I'm already certainly learning cosmology will never be the same, or it's absolutely incredible. So, as I said, it's something which we um, are quite proud of, and we hope that this will sort of <clears throat> be the start of a long and good collaboration between CERN and Google Arts and Culture. As I said, it allows people to explore CERN, what we are doing, it's from home, and um, also to learn more about the evolution of the universe. So um, Google Arts and Culture will come to CERN in a, in a week or two, and we will sort of continue, we'll discuss how we continue to collaborate on arts and science. Thank you very much.